Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Contagion. My name is John Parkinson, and I'm the senior editor. Joining us today is Dr. Alessandro Sete, a professor and member of the La Jolla Institute's Infectious Disease and Vaccine Center. Thank you, doctor, for being able to join us today. My pleasure. For those not familiar with your recent SARS-CoV-2 article, can you provide an overview of your research and your findings? So uh, this latest um, paper that just came out a few days ago in science is uh, uh, builds on a previous paper that came out a couple of months ago uh, in, uh, in Cell. And uh, take on messages where uh, from the Cell paper, essentially we uh, showed that we could accurately measure uh, and quantitate uh, helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells responses against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this is important. We purposely studied uh, convalescent people that didn't have a very severe case of disease. Uh, we studied this because we wanted to capture a success story, uh, a, a situation where the immune system had su uh, successfully dealt with the infection. And this also provides kind of a, a measuring post for what kind of response you would like to see in a vaccine, uh, uh, of course, of the many vaccines that are being developed. Uh, also, that uh, was important in terms of uh, uh, starting to ask the question, what's the difference between people that have very severe cases versus non-severe cases? Is the immune system, is there anything we want to imitate or avoid? But also, at the same time, in that uh, study, we detected responses uh, against SARS-CoV-2 pieces uh, in people that had not been exposed to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we ran a lot of studies, and so we had uh, blood draws uh, uh, frozen away in liquid nitrogen from 2015 to 2018, so possibly it, uh, these people could not have possibly been seeing SARS-CoV-2 in uh, Southern California. And rather, on a, this was a negative control for us. <laughs> and then uh, it turned out to be the negative, negative control was not so negative. And some of the people had reactivity. And we were very careful. Uh, and we convinced ourselves that this was uh, a real reactivity. And then this study has been, uh, similar results have been obtained in, uh, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in the UK, in Singapore. So at this point has been really reproduced in several different independent laboratories in seven different countries. So this is step one. There is in non-exposed, in some non-exposed individuals, some pre-existing reactivity against SARS-CoV-2. The immediate hypothesis that came to everybody's mind that this may have something to do with being exposed to common cold coronaviruses which, as the name says, are common and circulate uh, everywhere. Uh, but that was an hypothesis. This latest paper actually proves that. So we went uh, and mapped the specific amino acids recognized by T cells of non-exposed individuals uh, uh, in the SARS-CoV-2. And we mapped that, then we went and made synthesize the corresponding piece from the common cold corona. And we indeed proved that these uh, T cells cross recognized the common cold corona and SARS CoV 2. And in fact, in some cases, the, the, the thing that was recognized even better was the common cold, implying that what actually originally induced these T cells was a common cold. And if this the SARS-CoV-2 was a cross-reactivity of a similar sequence. Uh, and finally, also, we were able to show by looking at specific markers on the cell surface of uh, T cells, that these T cells were memory T cells. So that had seen uh, antigen before. They were not uh, uh, induced right there in the test tube. These were uh, 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 
conventional memory T cells that had been induced before uh, the SARS-CoV-2 um, pandemic. A very, very interesting, very fascinating. Can, and you'd mentioned, doctor, about the T cells. Can you talk about which T cells have been identified as potentially being able to fight the virus and, and why they might be effective? Well, yes. Uh, the, taking a step back, as uh, you probably know, the immune system, the adaptive immune system has three arms. Uh, one is the antibodies. Uh, that are the ones that uh, neutralize the virus, bind the virus incoming, and uh, uh, prevent the infection. Then there are two main types of T cells. One is the killer T cells, and the other is the helper T cells. Uh, the killer T cells are specifically devised to recognize infected cells and kill them. This is very important, not as much as to prevent an infection, but to terminate an infection. Because once the virus is inside the cell, it becomes invisible for antibodies because <clears throat> the antibodies can't get to it because it's inside the cell. But the killer T cells have the capacity of recognizing an infected cell and kill it. The other type of cell is this helper T cells, which as the name implies, they're helpful cells and how they're helped. They are helpful in three ways. One is that they are, uh, they support the development of the killer cells. Another way they can have a direct uh, antiviral effect by secreting cytokines uh, of uh, various type, TNF, uh, interferon gamma, and so forth. But the uh, most helpful function of helper T cells is that they actually regulate antibody development. So uh, without a helper T cells, antibody responses are very weak. They do not switch to IgG uh, and are of low tide. So you really need helper T cells to kick the antibody production in high gear, switch to the IgG, which are a more neutralizing uh, uh, strong antibodies. Very good. And obviously the core concept here is a large percentage of the population appears to have these immune cells that are able to recognize parts of uh, the virus. As such, what does it mean and can we take away something meaningful in terms of potential vaccines or therapies? Well, um, very good question and very important question. Uh, because that is the third um, uh, element in the logical progression here. So first set of studies said there is pre-existing activity. The second study said, yes, it is common cold. The third question that needs to be answered is, does it matter? Now, uh, is again tempting to speculate, to hypothesize, that this should be a good thing. But science needs facts, needs experiments to, uh, to prove or disprove what is at this point the theory. I mean, some uh, hypotheses could say, oh, this is actually not a good thing to have this pre-existing reactivity. Maybe if you have this pre-existing reactivity, uh, that is a disadvantage because, so to speak, the immune system uh, it's strict, uh, sees SARS-CoV-2 and thinks, oh, no big deal, it's just an, uh, another common cold, and kind of loses time before mounting uh, and taking things seriously. I don't think this is very likely. Another possibility is this just a, doesn't matter, that this pre-existing reactivity is not a sufficient magnitude to actually make a difference. And the third hypothesis, as uh, uh, we're saying, is this does matter, and uh, if you have this pre-existing memory, you may be able to mount a faster immune response or a stronger immune response. And this competitive edge might explain, in part, why some people get more sick than others. Uh, again, this has to be proven uh, and addressed experimentally. And there are a, a few different ways one can address this. Uh, one is 
uh, essentially a longitudinal study. Uh, basically, you take you know a bunch of people that have the pre-existing reactivity and a bunch of people that don't, and then you observe over a period of six months uh, what is the infection rate and what is the severity of disease in the people that had the pre-existing reactivity and people that did not. That is a very nice study. The problem with that is that essentially it has the same number requirement of a phase three study for a vaccine, right? Because you need to have, if you, the uh, infection rate is say is one in a hundred, to have 10 infections, you need to follow a thousand people. And so you, you need to have large number of people that are followed in both the people that have pre-existing and non-pre-existing to be able to then say something about it. 